Thank you so much for tuning into the show and welcome to Season 2 of The Audiobook Club with John York. The Audiobook Club, partnered with Pro Audio Voices, celebrates audiobooks, the amazing people and teams who make them happen, as well as the various talents behind storytelling. To learn more about Amplify and other opportunities to grow your sales, platform and audience, head over to ProAudioVoices.com and listen out for a short but informational advertisement within this episode. Let's start the show. Hello and welcome to the Audiobook Club. In this week's episode, we're so lucky to be joined by legendary audiobook narrator Stella Hunter. Stella, it's such a joy to have you on the show. How are you today? I'm great. I'm super excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, thank you for wanting to come on. Um, like, How's 2023 going for you so far? How are things? It's been a wild ride. <laughs> it <laughs> seems to be the case since like 2020. It just yeah. keeps going. It's like a roller coaster. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's it's busy, and um, I'm really grateful to have so much work and to be able to do fun things like this. Yeah. And so, yeah. But it's it's shaping up to be a very busy 2023. <laughs> Well, I'm looking forward to getting to uh, some of the things that are happening this year and have happened already. But first, I- I'd love to know how you first got started performing and, and narrating audiobooks. Would you mind telling us a little bit about your background and-, and how you found yourself in this mad world of storytelling? Sure, yeah. Um, so my journey into audiobook narration is pretty unique, although I feel like a lot of people have varied stories, you know. Mm-hmm, yeah. um, So I started out in college as an opera performance major, and um, after years of of working at that, my program was uh, discontinued, Mm -hmm. and I decided, you know, maybe this isn't for me. So I did community theater to keep my love of acting alive. I taught music lessons, taught voice lessons, and then I found writing, and through writing... I found audiobooks and I um, started a podcast as well called Audibly Addicted under my other name, my author name. And um, from there, I kept getting emails from listeners who kept saying, I love your voice. I want to hear you narrate an audiobook. Are you ever going to do that? Would you ever consider it? And I was always like, no, (laughs) no, that's not for me. And then after many more messages from people, I finally was kind of like, you know, I mean, I do have a background in acting. I have training. I have performance um, experience. So I'm not, you know, a stranger to any of this. So uh, I called up my buddy Shane East and was like, hey, Shane, what do you think? Like, is this something I could do? And he was sort of like, well, it's, you know, it's it's not just not just anybody can do it. Like, it's not super easy to just jump in and do it. And I was like, yeah, 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 yeah I understand that. <laughs> but, you know, is it something is my voice incredibly annoying? Should I not even try? And he was like, no, I think you should if you really want to do it, like, you know, find a coach and, and see if this is something you can do. And I had a lot of support from narrator friends who were very encouraging and I reached out to Erin Spencer, uh, who owns One Night Stand Studios, and she did a coaching session with me to kind of give me that permission that I needed, at being the person I am who craves validation. <laughs> <laughs> and she was like, "And w- yeah, I think you could do this. And from there, I just continued to work with coaches, uh, really wanted to, I knew I wanted to do romance, so I, I really worked on making sure that I could, you know, deliver a sex scene in a uh, way that wasn't a parody of a love scene and just continued to kind of work on my my skill to make sure that once it was time to really start doing this for other people, that I could. And then I, I narrated my own book as my very first one, which I have since re-recorded. <laughs> but... <laughs> But I could because it was my own. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> and then it just didn't really stop from there. And it was a whirlwind. It was auditions. And then it turned into people not even asking me to audition and just requesting me. And now it's I, I, I'm very, very lucky because I know this isn't uh, the typical journey for a lot of people. That's fantastic. So when you first, when you were doing those early books and you were taking mm-hmm. that, you know, going through coaching and uh, sort of, you know, entering this industry, was there like a particular part of narrating an audiobook that you found challenging, maybe something that you hadn't been aware of before taking up the, the passion? Um, definitely the amount of noises that my stomach makes. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and the time that it takes, you know, because you think, okay, well, it's this many words. It's only going to take me this long to do it. But you realize that no matter how seasoned you are, if you're not on your game that day, it's going to take you longer. If you have to do accent work, it's going to take you longer. If you just can't pronounce a word, it's going to take you longer. So you always, I think budgeting that time is something I still struggle with because, you know, on paper, I'm like, this should only take me this many days. And then it's inevitable that there's something that happens and then it takes me an extra day, you know, and and so I have to be very careful when I do my schedule because it's so easy to over schedule yourself without even realizing it. And so when I first started, I really was like, why am I not, you know, getting two finish hours done a day? Like, but if if this person can do it, why can't I do it? And then uh, my friend Aaron Shedlock, he was like, well, everybody's stamina is different. You know, so like, you can't just expect that you're going to dive in and do two finished hours a day without <laughs> falling over. And I was like, yeah. OK. <laughs> <laughs> so like, are you a person who's like tightly locked into a routine? Like we're talking about scheduling your, you know, your work day. Are, are, are you sort of tightly locked in a routine? Are you more flexible, you know, especially juggling lots of creative tasks and all the other things you're getting up to? I'd love to know how you kind of approach your work day. Well, uh, up until very recently, my work days were as I could fit it in because I was home with my kids. I was working from home. Um, My youngest is seven, so she's, you know, in school full time. But during COVID, I was homeschooling them. And I was also trying to record. And so I would record late at night um, and then wake up early. And, you know, so I was I was running myself into the ground because I was also writing. And uh, but recently I have rented myself an office space that's dedicated for my work and set myself real hours. So now my schedule is I work from 9 a.m. until 5 or 6 p.m. And that's it. And I leave my work at my office and I don't work when I'm home Um, because it's you know, it's so easy when you are a creative person to let it take over your whole life. And it will, you know, damage things in your in your world um, because your family needs your attention, too. And you need to have your own life outside of work. And it's very hard as a creative to do that. So that was a step that I took to really solidify that, like, these are my boundaries. This is my work time. And so I write in the morning from 9 until noon. Then I, you know, have lunch. And then I start about 1. And I record until I'm done for my day, for my schedule. If I don't get two full finished hours in, I don't. But I'm also really trying to protect my personal life and, you know, separate it a little bit. Um, So that's my goal for this year is to really find more balance because it is so easy to take every job because you're afraid that they're not going to be here again, you know. And so because that feast or famine mentality is is so true. And uh, so I just have to really remind myself anytime I get an email inquiring about availability and things like that, that I only have this many hours that I can really record. And so just because you want to take the job doesn't mean you you can, you know. 
Oh yeah, I resonate <laughs> so. with that so much. And that's something that I've struggled a lot with myself, like especially that scarcity mindset. Um, mm-hmm. But then also like because I, I work from home um, and you know, the house isn't, you know, it's not a massive house. So like I'm only ever only a few steps away from the computer, from the booth. Mm-hmm. And you just end mm-hmm. up working you know ridiculous hours yeah and I think especially if you're in charge of your own time you think well if I ignore it now am I being lazy and then you start Uh you know all that kind of stuff so I think yeah I think moving into a you know getting a your own dedicated space away from the house I can Mm -hmm. I can totally see why that's a a great great thing yeah and you know it's it's an expense but also it's a business expense and my accountant thanks me (laughs) because he's always like do you have a home office? Can we write off a home office? And I'm like, no, I have a couch and I have a little tiny spot for my booth. But, you know, like my kids running up and down the hallway above my booth, I have to stop and all of that stuff. But now the space I'm in is a second floor in an office building and it's super quiet and I can work without that kind of stress. And I think it's really helping for me personally to look at this as a as a job that I love that I'm so lucky to do, but remember that there is also life outside of it. So yeah, because that feeling like, oh, I'm lazy because I'm not working is something especially, I think, in America (laughs) that we deal with um, from, and and I think that it's just continuing to spread across the world and it's very dangerous because we should learn how to rest and relax. Oh, definitely. I think there is that that kind of hustle culture, isn't there? Of like you have to mm-hmm. work yourself into the ground, and um, mm-hmm. it can be incredibly dangerous. As I say, especially as you know, you're self-employed and you're in charge of bringing that work in. You mm-hmm. sort of there's that bit, you know, part of your mind that sort of thinks, "Am I doing enough? I'm never, you know, uh, this yeah. might not come again," and all that kind of mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. difficulty. It's very yep. challenging. Um, yeah. Romance audiobooks not only mm-hmm. expel passion to the listener but also incites passion within those listeners in a way that I don't think many things do. Mm-hmm. What is it about the romance genre in, in particular that, that draws you in as a performer? Well, I think at everybody's, well, this is just a generalization, obviously, but my theory is that at most people's core, their great story is the love story that they have. Whether it ends tragically or not, it shapes them quite often. And so to be able to tell those stories in a healing way, in a safe way, you know, where maybe it was a second chance romance with a high school sweetheart and somebody's listening who lost their high school sweetheart and or had a, a very upsetting breakup with that person that they're still trying to get over, because there are some loves that you never get over. Um, Being able to have that experience and listen to a story that is performed for you, that gives you that redemption, that fantasy of being able to come back to it and fix it, I think that there's something so healing about that. And I think that it's something that I'm very aware is a gift to be able to perform for people. Because, you know, there's a lot of spice. There's a lot of very sexy, sometimes, you know, there's degrading language. Sometimes there's over-the-top kink language. Um, But I think that if you're able to do it in a way that really respects the genre and respects the people who are listening to it and understanding that, like, these people who love these things, they're getting something really beneficial for them out of it. So for me, performing it is is really a privilege. And I think that for listeners, it really speaks back to that, like, giving them a safe place, you know, where they can count on a happily ever after. Because the promise of romance is a happily ever after. Like, no matter what, you're going to get that happily ever after. And if you don't, then it's not a romance. It's a love story, which is different. Yeah, definitely. I love that. I love the way that you... You put that, and especially about creating, you know, exploring things in, uh, in a in a safe space. Like, are you mm-hmm. when you're narrating, when you take on books, are you are you always thinking of the listener? Are you always thinking of yes. how it's going to be received? Yes, absolutely. The listener is the number one goal. You want, you know, in in my mind, I'm taking the author's words, interpreting them in the best possible way I can to give the listener the most positive experience they can have. 
because they're the audience. You know, just like just like when you're performing on stage or on screen, the goal should always be the viewer, you know, and what they're going to take away from it. But that's the same for me for an audiobook. One of my personal favorite things about narrating audiobooks is when you when you're narrating, you know, long form content just in general is that you, you end up taking on uh, characters that have obviously very vivid personalities and mm-hmm. and sometimes you can really exercise your your demons exercise your sassiness with these mm-hmm. characters as a performer and i just wondered like what are some of your 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 favorite character or or personality traits to voice in an wow. audiobook i mean i love getting to be a baddie <laughs> <laughs> getting to be a villain is my favorite thing because you can really play with that a lot yeah. Um, so, so I really enjoy that. I also really love being a neurotic character because mm. I think people are usually everyone has their own neuroses, and to be able to tap into that is so much fun because it normalizes it a little bit, you know, and um, because it's always seen as such a bad thing when in reality everyone has it. So. I, I enjoy being able to tap into that and and really go all out with a character who is, you know, spun up easily, goes on wild tangents, but is still the heroine of the story. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, those are kind of my two favorite things. Oh, yeah, definitely. I love a character who's, you know, sarcastic and maybe even perhaps a little bit bitter about the world. And it's mm-hmm. almost like therapy. You know, I, mm-hmm. I narrate early in the morning. So it just, it, you know, if I if I sort of have a bit of a rant at the world first thing, it sort mm-hmm. of makes me feel a little better about the <laughs> day. Just dive in. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, it's really, uh, it's very fun to do that. And it's also fun to have these big characters. Um, so like when I get to do fantasy or paranormal and I get to do a lot of character work, that's really fun for me, especially if I get to do a lot of accent work, because then I can really differentiate them. Um, recently, I got to do like little demonic imps who were just on a wild tear and they were so much fun because I got to do these character voices that I don't normally get to do in romance because, you know that's not sexy. <laughs> so so that was a that was a good time. That was a good time. And I love an unhinged an unhinged villain who doesn't realize they're a villain is is really fun. So yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. definitely. I think there's a little part of ourselves in characters like that or at least I hope so. Maybe oh, it's yeah. not just, maybe it's just me. But oh, sometimes yeah. yeah. It's not just you. <laughs> <laughs> like I used to want to be I still do want to be maleficent. Like if yeah. if I could be any Disney villain, it would be her. Oh yeah. Definitely. Well, I had the um, I narrated for uh, Never Never by Serena Valentina for Disney. Oh yeah. Um, yeah, and it, it was the story of Captain Hook, um, oh, and his like origin story. One. And oh my gosh, that that was therapy for me. <laughs> but, <laughs> I need to listen to that. I love Captain Hook. <laughs> um, so we mentioned there's lots of events coming up this year. We've mm-hmm. also we've of course had a biggie at the end of March, um, which was APAC, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, how was APAC for you this year? How could you could you let us know about your you know your overall experience of that event? I really enjoyed it. I didn't get to um, soak up in, enough of the panels, but that was mostly because I was really overwhelmed. Uh, there were so many people, and I felt like I wanted to meet people more than I wanted to sit in on a panel because when I was sitting there, I couldn't meet people. (laughs) And I was like, there's a limited amount of time. And I I also had a panel that I was participating on that I was extremely nervous for. So um, that was, I don't know, that was a little bit stressful for me because I felt like I had to be so focused on, I'm about to be up here in front of all these people talking about TikTok. (laughs) And like, very scared that I was going to make an absolute fool of myself. And um, I only made a fool of myself one time when I didn't know how the microphone worked. But <laughs> Well, I'm so pleased you segued into that because I was at that um, panel and I thought it was amazing. And I thought you were great um, always. Um, I thought it was a fantastic panel. Um, and it certainly didn't come across like you were nervous. It was oh, um, it's really helpful to me. I was wondering if going from there, I'd love to talk a little bit about TikTok, if that's okay. Mm-hmm. okay. So like, 
So TikTok continues to be, you know, a real hub for narrators in terms mm-hmm. of you know, growing their brand, and networking and all that kind of stuff. Um, I mean, at, at the time of recording, you have like 40,000 followers on TikTok, which is yeah, very in- nearly yeah. incredible. Yeah. Has TikTok aided your, your, your business and, and opportunities yeah. like since beginning your account? Yeah, it um so I was already booking quite a lot. Like I was already mm. quite busy. Um but at this particular point in my career after TikTok, I am now like 12 months in advance for large projects mm. is where I'm at. Wow. So I would say that it has definitely boosted my career. Um there are books I've definitely gotten because the authors requested me because they watched me on TikTok. I've gotten at least 10 jobs in the last three months that were authors directly contacting me from TikTok. Um, so absolutely, there there is a big benefit um, if you can capture your audience. That's the trick. I don't know how I did that. I really don't. I, I get on there and I look like a full bridge troll <laughs> and I'm narrating live, you know, with like bags under my eyes and my hair in a wild messy bun (laughs) but for some reason they like to watch you know and and I'm thankful that they do that but it's uh it's very interesting to see that they the people who watch really love the ASMR aspect of it you know they they want to listen and our voices are already um made for that you know that's what they do anyway so uh, they will listen. They will read along with the book if they can get it bef- while I'm recording it. They will follow along and say, which chapter are we on? And then they'll start reading too. And that's beneficial to the author as long as they're legally acquiring the book. And um, I think that it's just another marketing tactic for authors who give permission. So, Yeah. Do you think like, because of course, like um, authors and and rightly so are sometimes very guarded about their content. Do you think we'll see a change in that moving forward? Of course, there's more authors getting more savvy to to TikTok Mm -hmm. and and sort of open up. But do you think that's going to be something that narrators should really jump on board with to offer that service for their authors and the publishers, etc., to to do a little bit of live narrating? I think there is a strong case for offering the author's exposure because you're being paid to do the book and you're already doing your job at the same time while you're, Mm -hmm. you know, while you're alive. Um, So it's not really extra work because you're there already doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's also the case for, well, I'm doing an advertisement for this author now, so shouldn't I be paid for that time separately? Yeah. And I think that really is, is dependent upon the person you know, the narrator themselves and what they, um, how they look at it. Personally, I don't charge a fee for that because I am, like I said, already working. But I Mm. also frame my lives in that way. And I say, I can't answer your questions because I am working. You're watching me record an audiobook in real time. Yeah. And I, I will answer questions when I'm on a break. But other than that, like, this is the process and that's what you get to see. Because if it was something where I had to do like a whole Q&A and was sitting there and like talking up the book and things like that, it might be different where I would ask for a fee. But I think that authors, particularly indie authors, they see the value and they uh, are happy to let you do it for the most part. Some people are very protective of their um, uh spoilers and things like that because if the book isn't out yet they don't want people to know but the tiktok culture is a spoiler culture Hmm. they want to know everything they want a trigger warning for anything possibly that might happen yeah um they want to know ahead of time if you know the the couple's gonna get together if there's gonna be an accidental pregnancy all of those things like they they want that. That's the culture there. So it's a little bit of a different mindset that I think authors need to take into consideration if they're hesitant. And just remember that, like, there's no such thing as a spoiler on TikTok. Yeah. It's strange, isn't it? Because it's, it's a real, it's a, it seems like such a new way of doing things, but is so popular 
Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's a real hotspot for lots of different things, but especially books. And, you know, you have book talk and narrator mm-hmm. talk and all that kind of thing. It's um, it's really exciting, I feel. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think so. I think it, it can be a little bit scary because they, um, you know, if you step out of line and and you know put your foot in your mouth or say something mm-hmm. and say something really harmful that you didn't even if you didn't realize it was harmful if you don't respond mm-hmm. in the right way that can really damage your career as well mm-hmm. but um i think one of the big things that is important is if you mess up genuinely apologize yeah. and then do better you know like that's that's the big thing that's the most important thing you can do is be genuine and own up to your mistake and then do better. Yeah. I think that like like some of the advice on that TikTok panel was, you know, hold yourself accountable, be mm-hmm. authentic as well, which I think is a big mm-hmm. one. And something that I struggle with a lot. I think it's just nerves, really. It's not mm-hmm. that I don't want to be authentic. I just, I'm trying to project a higher version of myself just through, mm-hmm. you know, nervous about that. So I think it's, yeah, I think there was some really great tips on, on and you know be be authentic and be you know be yourself um mm-hmm. there is something along those lines because i am in awe of how strong of a brand you have created and for those narrators who are in the early stages of their career and 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 are looking at how to separate themselves from the pack like have you any advice for those in that position so my my brand is just me yeah. like i i don't do well with a like a persona because yeah. it it is inauthentic and I don't like that. Yeah. My goal is to be a safe place for my authors, to be a safe place for my listeners and to respect the genre that I am primarily narrating in. Mm-hmm. And that's just kind of who I am in general. You know, like I want to be a safe space for people. I want mm-hmm. to be a kind person. I don't want to hurt people. Like if I hurt somebody's feelings, it ruins me yeah. for a long time. I'll probably think <laughs> about it forever, you know. So I I think that that authenticity is the big big piece of this. Like you don't have to put on a show for people. They'll like you because you're you. Yeah. And that's what you want anyway, you know. Like that's how you build a community is with, you know, being genuine and letting them see you. Now, you don't have to give them full access to you because that's not what this is. But letting them see that you are a human and that you are somebody with feelings and that you care about issues and all of that, I think, is really important. Um, So, yeah, so that's why I show my face because hiding for me, again, felt disingenuous. Mm -hmm. And so I was just like, you know, this is what I look like. And if you don't like it, then don't watch me. <laughs> <laughs> I get you completely. With, um, you know, building a community of your own, with taking part in the wider narration and author communities, how important is community to you in a job that can, you know, oftentimes be rather solitary? I think community is important. Um, I think that it can feel very competitive, And Mm. so the, which might be, you know, sound cliche, but the um, old adage of um, comparison is the thief of joy, which I think it was Eleanor Roosevelt who said that, it is so true. And so I think that once you separate the comparison piece and start building relationships with people, Mm -hmm. you learn that we're all kind of in the same boat. And from there, you can really learn things because we should always be learning. So I learn learn from other authors on the author side of my life. I learn from other producers on the producer side of my life. And I learn from other narrators. You know, like I think that instead of looking at people as a competition, we should look at them as allies and peers. And I think that really helps. Um, But you have to be willing to do that. And I think it's in any kind of creative or arts related environment it's super easy to get caught up in the in the uh, competition of it all yeah. so you know i think for me it took me a long time to learn that as an author because i came into it with nobody 
and felt like I had nobody for the longest time until I found my, you know, people who were in my mm. corner. And I realized not everybody has to be in your corner, mm. but just a couple really solid people who care about you, just like any friendships would go. Yeah. And then it's building your community of readers or listeners. Those are the people that come to you because they like what you do. And so as long as they're not stepping over boundaries that you set and they're respecting you, then, you know, love them and support them. Yeah. Because they're the people who keep you going. Moving, I'd love to ask you just a quick question about mm -hmm. writing, if that's okay. Of course. Um, I just wondered, with since narrating audiobooks and obviously narrating and reading and prepping so many stories, has that impacted your writing in any way? Um, well, I think I'm taking, I'm consuming more media than I used to. Mm -hmm. But I do think that when I write, I write with particular phrases that I don't enjoy saying in mind that I keep out of my own books. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. Because I narrate my own books. Um, and so if there are phrases that I don't like to say, I don't put them in my books. Like <laughs> sheepish smile. <laughs> Do you enjoy the process of narrating your own books? Um, I do. At first, I was very embarrassed about it <laughs> because I all my books are done in duet style and a mm -hmm. lot of them we record at the same time. Um, not always because it doesn't always work for the schedule, but it is there is something magical about getting to record together. It is like doing, you know, a live performance. Yeah. Um, and I love that um, aspect of collaboration with my partner. But in the very, very beginning, yes, I, I struggled <laughs> with that mm -hmm. because my books are spicy and yeah. I'm on the line with these, you know, male narrators who I don't know super well, you know, um, and I have to say spicy things to them and they have to say spicy things to me and I have to not laugh <laughs> at myself <laughs> writing it you know like i think yeah. it's so different when you're reading somebody else's words you're just like and this is what is happening and it's not a big deal but when you are the one responsible for making those words happen yeah <laughs> it puts a different lens on it and so then i get into the like if i let myself i'll get into the space of like oh my god shaney's just had to say that to me <laughs> in my ears and i have to say this back to him and i made it happen oh no you know, and then I quickly got over that. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. And a part of that is because, you know, everyone I've worked with, um, I've been very lucky to work with very professional people who make me feel very safe when I'm working mm. with them. Because when you're in the middle of a love scene and you're on the line with that person, it does, you know, change some things between you at that moment because you're those characters, you know, mm -hmm. they're your scene partner. And just like being on stage with somebody where you have to kiss them or something like that, it's, there is a weird sort of barrier yeah. that has to get broken a little bit. And that can quickly turn into something that is an uncomfortable situation. But mm -hmm. that all depends on how you respond to it. And, you know, everyone I've worked with has been so professional and focused on the work and not made me feel inappropriate or uncomfortable or anything like that. So and I think that just goes across the board. I have never had an experience with a narrator partner who has made me uncomfortable or crossed any kind of line. Mm. And, uh, you know, much to the disappointment of listeners who were like, oh, maybe they'll fall in love, you know, and I'm like, no, I know what he sounds like when he burps. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, of course, you're no stranger to podcasting yourself. And I just wondered, maybe seem a little cheeky coming from what, um, you know, situation we're in currently, but I just wondered if you had any advice on making a good podcast. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think you're, you're, this sounds great. Like you have really great questions and you're prepared. And so I think that um, my podcast is probably not a great example because we just are, it's like the Wild West and we, <laughs> we just, we sort of lay down some rails, but the train never gets on them, you know, <laughs> we yeah. just sort of let it go naturally. Um, I, I think that me personally, I enjoy a conversational podcast. I enjoy it when there's silliness. I enjoy when there's lots of laughter and 
Yeah. You can tell that the guests are enjoying their time there. Um, and so I think that for any sort of conversation, that's always the best, whether it's like a fireside chat where you've got a cocktail and you're just sitting down and you're you're talking about whatever happens to come up. Um, you know, and then the host is gently keep trying to keep things on the rails, <laughs> <laughs> but everyone else is not on on board. So, yeah. yeah. So those are my favorite. I don't know. I think that that's a fun way to, to listen. And then you can, again, it's that authenticity piece, right? Like people want to hear you enjoying yourself. I guess, I guess it's kind of similar to why it's like a little bit why TikTok's kicked off is I think especially like you know the the, the channels dedicated to something that someone's passionate about because it's mm-hmm. so nice to watch someone who's passionate about something talking about and I think that's very much the same it's really fun to listen to people who are having a great time absolutely so like one thing that I find so so cool is that you have merch and with yes. with the proceeds heading straight to the the Trevor project, would you mm-hmm. would you mind telling us a little about how that opportunity, you know, to have merch came about with Addicted to the Voice, and and then the the, the Trevor project? So I um, was approached by uh, the person who runs Addicted to the Voice, mm-hmm. and she was like, "Hey, I really want," because she had done merch for male narrators, mm-hmm. and there's a you know there's a disparity between male and female narrators um, in a lot of different ways. But I think a lot of it is because the listenership is primarily female Mm. and they just really gravitate toward the hero, you know. And so Mm -hmm. I'm I'm your best friend, but he's the love of your life, you know. (laughs) So (laughs) it makes sense to me. It's fandom, you know, and that's what fandom does. Like that's why everyone follows Henry Cavill, you know. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So... Um, when she asked me about merch, I was like, well, yeah, I don't know if anybody's going to want any merch, but of course I'd love to do that. And then she was talking about royalties and and I was like, look, I don't really need royalties, but I, I would love to just donate my portion to the Trevor Project. And, um, I have always, up until the last five years, I considered myself an ally. And then I did a lot of research as I was... Um, as I was writing uh, my first male-male romance, mm-hmm. and I started really researching bisexuality and um, the overall kind of umbrella and the, and the spectrum of sexuality, and really came to realize that I am actually a bisexual woman, but I've always just been in heterosexual relationships. Mm. And so for me, it was even more important to support a charity that, you know, helps to protect LGBTQ youth and support them. And, you know, as somebody who experienced body erasure my whole life, um, learning about that and discovering it about myself really, I don't know, it just struck a chord in me and made me want to give back as much as I can. And taking money for merch for me just didn't seem right when I could donate it. Yeah. I think that's amazing. And for the listeners uh, who are interested in picking up some merch, I'll make sure that the link is front and center um, in the show notes. So folks can have a little look and, uh, and get their stuff. Yeah, Um, Yeah. I'd love to know what you get up to when you, when you're not, you know, writing, when you're not in the booth, what is it? What could we often find you doing on, on some time off? I love a good walk when the weather's nice. I live in Washington State where it's beautiful when it's not raining. Um, and my <laughs> office is very close to the water, so I, I like to walk at lunchtime. Um, I listen to audiobooks all the time, so yeah. uh, you'll find me listening to an audiobook. I will also, um, my my favorite place to be is my hammock <laughs> on my deck <laughs> with a glass of wine. So. Yeah. You know, I I try to rest. My kids will be outside playing in the backyard and I'll be on the deck in the hammock, possibly taking a nap. <laughs> <laughs> so that's those are kind of the, the main things. But like I said, I'm really trying to find that balance so that I can go do more things. Like I, I do love going to do wine tastings and I like to go explore the peninsula where I live and yeah. uh, that kind of stuff. So... Nothing sounds too good fancy. to me. No, that sounds good to me. A hammock and a glass of wine, you had me there. That's, yeah. <laughs> that sounds like the vibe. Um, so where's the best place for our listeners to keep up with you? 
Um, my website is horribly un updated so not there <laughs> <laughs> um instagram and tiktok are probably the biggest places where you can find me um and instagram uh and tiktok i think i'm both of those i'm still a hunter narrator yeah so and i post about my new releases uh on twitter but twitter is sort of a can i swear Am I allowed to say yeah, of, yeah, okay. of course. Yeah. <laughs> Twitter's a shit show, so I don't know if we're <laughs> if we're gonna keep on on the Twitter, but yeah. I do post my new releases there. But the the TikTok is the one I'm the most active on. Awesome, awesome stuff. Well, I'd just love to, as we come towards the end of the show, sort of just ask if you have any upcoming projects that you're excited about, anything that's in the calendar that we could look forward to that you'd like to share. Oh, yeah, I have lots of things. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm going to plug my own series because it's yeah. almost over. So The Mate Games Pestilence is wrapping up on May 22nd, so right at, right before this episode drops. And mm-hmm. so Lost to the Moon comes out then with the ebook and audio and paperback. And that's the um, fourth book in the Pestilence series. And it's a multicast, full cast audio with me, James Joseph, John Hartley, um, Teddy Hamilton uh, and Jacob Morgan and did I for- and JF Harding? How could I forget my sweet JF Harding? <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's a it's so much fun to do multicast projects. It's it's so cinematic listening yeah. to it. Um, I don't like to listen to myself, but I can listen to those because I forget that it's me because it's the whole cast that's involved. Yeah. Um, so that's coming out, and we're very excited about it. Uh, I am very, like, f- fangirl excited that I'm doing a title for Samantha Young, who's one of my very favorite authors. She was probably one of the very first indie authors I ever read. So yeah. I'm doing a book called Beyond the Thistles with Shane East, and I get to – he's he gets to be a Scottish hero, so I get to dust off my – Scottish male voice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> so that's another one I'm excited about. And um, there are so many projects on my schedule that I would, I'm sure, leave somebody out and I would feel really bad. So I'm going to stop there. <laughs> <laughs> well, those two sound fantastic. Um, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing the uh, the Scots. That's, yes. Uh, yeah, yes. it's one of my favourites. Um, well, that just brings us to about to a close for this episode of the Audiobook Club. All of the links to Stella's social media website and upcoming titles will be linked in the show notes. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. And of course, another huge, huge thank you to you, Stella, for joining us. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for inviting me. This is super fun. Frustrated by the royalty rates for your audiobook? Annoyed that when the digital distributors say 70% royalties, they actually mean 70% of 50% or 80% of 70%, neither of which is an actual 70%. Wishing there was a way to cut out the middleman? Yet, you want your audiobook listeners to have a smooth and positive experience, and a direct download sale from your website won't deliver that. We at Pro Audio Voices hear you. Out of our commitment to our author clients, we've created Amplify, a program that provides an actual 65% of the sales price that you set, that gives you access to your customers' names and emails so you can reconnect with them, and keeps you in the driver's seat. Check it out at ProAudioVoices.com. You'll find Amplify in the marketing menu.